welcome to the Great British Quilter podcast. I'm Sarah Ashford, and as a modern quilter and founder of the Great British Quilter Instagram Challenge, I've spent the last three years galvanising and championing British quilters and the quilting industry. In this series, I speak to British quilt designers, fabric companies, publishers and shop owners to discover their behind-the-scenes stories and to discuss what it means to be a part of the British quilting community today. My sponsors for this episode are Today's Quilter and Love Patchwork and Quilting magazine, two delightful magazines that cover all you need to know about quilting. Today's Quilter provides a fresh take on traditional quilting with 100 glorious pages of projects, features and news for the intermediate to experience quilter. Love Patchwork and Quilting brings you the best of modern quilting, featuring clear step-by-step projects for quilts, cushions, home style and gifts, with something for every skill level. Both magazines come with a handy quilting supplement in every issue. You can try these magazines out for yourself with this exclusive three issues for £5 offer. Visit www.buysubscriptions.com forward slash the GBQ podcast. My guest today is quilt pattern designer Nicola Dodd. Nicola established her pattern company Cake Stand Quilts in 2015, having previously worked as an architect and garden designer. She designs regularly for today's Quilter magazine, shares projects on the Moda Bake Shop website and recently designed a set of quilt blocks for clothing brand Sea Salt. As well as selling quilt patterns and kits on her website, Nicola enjoys writing tutorials on her blog and chatting to fellow quilters on Instagram. Mostly self-taught, she is now an active member of her local guild, the Shropshire Quilters, and lives near Shrewsbury with husband Mark, sons Tom and Joe, who are both at university, and Buddy the Lurcher. I travelled up to Bristol where we met at the Immediate Media offices and we were lucky enough to use their recording studio to record this podcast. Enjoy. Morning, Nicola. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming on to the Great British Quilter podcast. Uh, So here we are. Um, I'm again at the Immediate Media Studios in Bristol. Uh, Thank you for coming down from Shropshire to meet me. It's lovely to have you here. It's brilliant. It's quite great pleasure to be on because I'm a great podcast listener so it's lovely to perfect <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us how did you first get into quilting uh, completely by accident I'll be honest I'm a serial craft trier so I think I was looking for fabric um probably that's normally what I'm looking for we were doing up a house at the time and I stumbled onto Camille Ross Kelly's um blog oh yes simplify um, I think she just started as a moda designer though it was back in about 2010 so she's a moda designer with her mum and she just um, started designing fabric. And I'd never seen um, quilting before. Loved her blog. She's a brilliant photographer. Yes, she has beautiful so, she, um, so the blog was just beautiful. So I thought, oh, this looks really interesting. And I remember telling my mum, oh, I think I'm going to try quilting. And there must have been some eye rolling because my normal, um, my normal uh, way of doing things is to get really into a craft like needle point knitting whatever it might be buy about 20 books be very (laughs) ambitious about the first project um get halfway through it and then quietly put it in the back of a cupboard Mm -hmm. although I keep the books you know so that's good I have something to show for it (laughs) so uh, so I said I was going to go into quilting and I got my little cutting board and I didn't really buy a lot a lot bought some charm packs I think I did a I did a Moda bake shop um project Camila designed um a little table runner which is with charm charm squares staying together so I made one of those and I thought, hmm, yeah, I'm quite, quite enjoying this. I finished it, which is a, pretty much a first for me. Um, I then got a couple of her patterns, simpler patterns, like a half square triangle chevron quilt I made. And I, oh, yes. I still have that in the garden room at home. And um, just loved doing it. And, you know, put the final stitch in the binding and thought, yeah, I want to make another one. This is for me. This yeah. is the craft for me. Yes. And I sort of I finally found my thing I love doing. Um, yeah, so I, I, I haven't stopped making quilts since, really. No, absolutely. So uh, you have a background in conservation architecture and design. Um, what did this job entail and how has this helped and in- inspired you with your quilting? Well, yeah, I originally, um, if, sort of in the years BC, before children, I worked as an architect. And I loved I loved that job. Um, I wanted to be an architect since, since I was a little girl. Um, and I mainly worked with listed buildings which, you know, you get to work with wonderful materials and the buildings themselves have a real personality. So they kind of tell you what they want to do. 
And it was a, a really wonderful job, but the hours were very long. And I knew when I had the children that I just was not going to be able to. I've got two little boys. I wasn't, I wasn't going to. It was not very little, actually, quite big. But I knew I couldn't be a mother to them and do all those long hours. Yeah. So I did stop for a little while. And then I worked, when they were at school, I worked part-time for a local architect. Um, these are mainly on private houses. And again, there were, a lot of them were old or listed. Um, I really love old buildings. I mean, I always have. I always have loved old buildings. Um, and I got very into garden design because we had to do something with our own garden. And my, I, you know, if we need something doing at home, I mean, apart from anything, you know, kind of serious like carpentry or plumbing, if there's something needs doing, I'd rather learn how to do it and do it myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I already knew a little bit about groundworks, but I, I went down to Chelsea Physic Garden, did some courses down there on planting um, and then worked as a garden designer while the children were at school, really. And I was st doing that when I picked up quilting. And a lot of flowers and trees and things yeah. featuring and buildings as well. Very much so, all over the quilts. quilts. Yeah, so I've funny. just had a sneak peek at uh, your latest commission yes. and there are buildings. There are buildings. There. Yes. And if you follow me on Instagram, you'll know I've travelled to a few places lately and there might be featuring. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> to go and do your research properly, you know, you're allowed to travel to get the research just right. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, so what prompted you to start Cake Stand Quilts, your own pattern um, business? Uh, I absolutely love your designs, by the way. Thank you, Sarah. They uh, Now, I've always been a pattern tweaker. I mean, there was the odd early pattern that I made as, as I was told to. But whenever I made a pattern, I couldn't help tweaking because mm -hmm. I think, you know, once you've had a good British design training, you just can't help yourself. Um, so I, I then, I think... I think it was some more of Bonnie and Camille fabric, actually. They they released a, a collection called April Showers, which was incredibly British. It had little brollies on and polka dots and gingham. And the little brolly reminded me of a Dresden fan. Mm -hmm. um, and then I didn't... I'd bought one of those funny-shaped te templates, Dresden templates, and uh, had to go at making them not very successfully. So I kind of put that aside for one minute. Um, and I used to get a, a fig tree publication. I don't think she does them anymore, but she used to do like a quarterly magazine called Fresh Vintage. And she had a Dresden project on there. And her approach to constructing Dresden is very different. That you, um, you use a jelly roll strip the way you would with a, temp with a template, but you don't, actually, you don't actually cut out a funny shape. You stitch the shape. And then you don't ah. you don't cut until you stitch a bit of the way we make half square triangles now, and do those easy corner triangles where you have a little square yes. stitch diagonally, flip out and yes. trim. And a penny kind of dropped with me then, so I thought, oh, I can make that umbrella thing now. So I sort of went crazy, sort of over a weekend made this um, made this quilt and, and shared my progress on Instagram. And a few of the ladies were saying, oh, I'd love to make one of those. So I said, well, you know, this this is how you make the Dresden and la, 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 la. And a few made it and a few, and I sort of emailed them instructions how to do it. And then a couple of the ladies said, well, I, I can't follow a diagram. Would you not write a pattern for that, Nicola? <laughs> I was thinking, well, yeah, I suppose I could write a pattern. That would be fine. Um, and so I did. It took a really long time um, because, you know, you first time you do anything it's always quite clunky so it took months and months to write this pattern and then of course I needed to test the pattern so I had to make another quilt <laughs> exactly the same I'd already gifted the first one to my niece had just been born so that was that was her quilt because her sister was really into Mary Poppins so we thought the umbrella thing Perfect, yes. worked really well for that family so I made another one and then I I always had these quilt ideas in the back of my gardening notebooks I've kept notebooks ever since um I trained as an architect, really, so I've got I've got them going back a really long time. Um, and I, I used to have all my garden notes and garden designs in the front of the notebook, and then quilting ideas were in the back. And I got a point where I got to the middle from the back quicker yes. than I got. <laughs> and I got to the, the, the middle from the front. Um, so I thought, well, I just, now I just wonder. And I thought I might get a little Etsy shop. And about that time, they changed all the tax. Do you remember them changing all the tax yes. systems? The EU changed all the tax systems, so you had to pay um, tax in the country that the pattern was going. It all sounded like a total nightmare. And a lot of the um, quilt designers then swapped over to pay hip. Yes. Um, so my plans to open an Etsy shop kind of were shelved quietly. And then I thought, I'll open a, a pay hip shop. And the pay hip shop, it, it's not very customizable. So I needed to have um, a kind of front door to this shop. So I then had to build a website. So that was another whole rabbit hole to fall down. And there, you can actually quite easily build a website now. You don't need to code or anything, although 
I'm sure I could have drafted the children in for that kind of thing. But it's a lot more accessible now. Yeah, it's very point and click. So I, I sort of, um, so I tweaked. I spent ages tweaking this website before I actually launched it. And I think I had, you know, I said I had the one pattern in my pay hip shop for about six months. And then I think I had four patterns in my shop when I eventually opened the website and it stayed like that for a really long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, pattern <laughs> writing, like you say, yeah. it takes a long time to, to perfect a and pattern. And, and I still consider myself a beginner, really. And I think lots of ideas I had in my, my sketchbook, I did, didn't quite know how I was going to make them. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want, when I wrote a pattern, I didn't want people to have to go out and buy acrylic templates and stuff yeah. to be able to make them. So there were lots of things, little kind of technical things I had to get my head around before I could release the patterns because I um, I use a triangle in a square shape quite a lot in my patterns because it adds another angle so you can do steep roofs and you know the birds yes. can have pointy beaks and I use it quite a lot and I, I kind of had to come up with an easy way of doing that that didn't require you to use have to go and buy an acrylic template because you know that adds a quite a chunk of cost onto a pattern and I think it's sometimes off-putting to people very much so yeah all this specialist equipment and rulers and things like that and even sort of to ask people to paper piece because there are lots of ways of making that shape you know and the more the merrier really if there's a there's a a way that you like doing it but I again that can be very off-putting to people so it took me a while to come up with a method that I felt was easy enough to put into the pattern that would open all of those different things up would allow give me freedom as a designer and allow people to make the patterns really easily yes and and I then had a little blog on my website just to support my customers really so I, d- I did photo tutorials of that funky shape you know how yes, I made that's it really handy isn't it yeah so that people when they were buying they could go onto the blog and have a look and I would always always encourage people to email me and they do because I, I think if you're at home stuck quietly fuming about something you can't make please email me because a you know we'll sort it out and you you know you'll definitely be able to do it but b it's it's, you know it's a great subject for me to write a blog post about and it's it's all a conversation you know I wouldn't be sitting here now if I hadn't read other people's blogs absolutely so it's about communicating absolutely so you know what goes around comes around really doesn't it and you want people to succeed and make your quilts don't you you don't want want them to put it in the corner and move on to something else when I go to festival quilts I don't want to come up crying I want to come (laughs) and show you a photograph of something they've made yeah they're finished quilts saying hey look what I did (laughs) absolutely so how do you use social media to promote yourself and your business well, it's funny because I, I don't, I wouldn't be sitting again. Wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't, if I hadn't been on Instagram because it was that that sort of very um, supportive community that got me designing in the first place um, and encouraged me to open the shop. Um, I was on Instagram really early, not not by design really, but more. Um, I just blundered on there quite early in the game, so it, it probably. 2011 had been on there a really long time yeah that is a long time when I was still garden designing mainly and it was because I was working on my own from home it was a lovely it was kind of my lunch break thing yeah or and it became you know it gets a bit obsessive you kind of find yourself on there a bit more than you should be should don't you so often it would kind of be waiting in the car to pick the children up from school time as well and you at that point it was chronological so you'd connect with different makers um at different times of the day you know yes. your Aussies in the morning and uh, you know the Brits at lunchtime and then the Americans be there at, for the school run and uh, and I did a few sew alongs on Instagram which was really fun um, you hosted them or joined well, no, in joined with in them? with them oh, okay. joined it because that was kind of pre-pattern writing days so a lot of there were a few Bonnie and Camille um mm-hmm. well Camille Ross Kelly or her friends would organise sew alongs I do a few I mean they're ahead of their time really to really be very much yeah sew alongs on Instagram really so early on and actually the the biggest one I did um was Katie Jones she Brit, Brit Katie yes, Jones who did yes. the, the swoon along which was one of Camille's patterns oh yes I do remember. so I did that and there was there were thousands of people in that that was on Flickr actually I was on Flickr before then there were thousands of people doing making that one which was really great um, so I find Instagram's a social, a very social place for me. So I suppose I think of it more of a place where I can get in touch really easily with my customers and, and with my friends. So I suppose there's a little bit of me that feels a bit awkward and kind of hopelessly British about promoting myself on there. Um, I c- kind of think of it as a behind the scenes because there's always going to be a bit of garden and a bit of pet and a bit of but sewing. But people like that because it shows so. all of you then, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, so often I think it's a way that people can directly see what I'm looking at and what's inspiring me. So I, I suppose I consider the website, because I have more control over that really, is the place where it's all about um, the business really. Yes. Whereas Instagram, it's still under my own name and it's more... 
about it's slightly more informal isn't it? very much so instagram yeah. and that's what's so lovely yeah. about the platform and it's lovely i like a chat frankly so it's really <laughs> good <laughs> yeah it's a great place to chat it yeah, really is really is and and connect with like-minded people exactly I mean, it's and they're lo- and they're lovely you know and, and there's so much i follow i i follow a few quilters on there but mostly i follow illustrators and knitters and embroiderers because i tend to get my inspiration kind of left of field yes. it's it's sort of peripheral things that Inspire go into you. the yes. quilts yeah I don't antique quilts I love I really really love antique quilts and they often they'll inspire a thing but often it'll be a piece of embroidery a cross stitch or actually or a little painting that'll set things Thoughts whirling in yeah for a quilt pattern yeah yeah and I love Instagram because you can um, make it what you want it to be like you say you can follow Absolutely. illustrators gardeners whatever your specialist interest is you can follow the those people and then your feed becomes all of the things that you love exactly uh, yes it's great absolutely brilliant um so many of us know you from your beautiful quilts and projects in um today's quilter uh can you tell us a little bit about some of your favorite quilts you've made for them and the inspiration behind them yeah i was picking my favorite child (laughs) sarah sorry tricky question (laughs) no um actually there is one i'm enormously proud of um which was uh the kitchen garden quilt which was i think published last february and what we'll do i'll get you to uh, yeah. send me a picture of that oh, and then we can uh, put that on instagram Fantastic. so people can see what you're talking well, I w- about i will well i've just uh, that's been on instagram a little bit because that's out of copyright with today's quilter now and i know a lot of people struggle to get that magazine because it was in the little um little supplement that came with the magazine right, yes. and it was in its own little seed packet it was just amazing you know i loved the way they presented it it was so fun Perfect. it that's was really great. good um but if you couldn't get that i've now published that as a standalone pattern which you can you can I think my copies are coming any day, but you can certainly get it on Amazon. It's a it's a print on demand pattern. Okay. So that you can just it just means because posting obviously posting little light single quilt patterns that's reasonably inexpensive. You know, mm-hmm. I send them off. To, I send the, the majority to America, but you know, Australia, Germany, Norway, Canada, they go all over the place. Um, but posting those books it can be quite expensive. Yes. So the Amazon option just means that you can get them where you are which keeps the postage cost down really low which is fantastic you know it's a lovely resource oh, that's a great for idea. independent pattern designers actually yeah really good really really good so that's one of your favorite I think quilts. that's my that's my have my heart a little bit really I must confess I mean I I'd, I mean can you la- just talk us through it what what um, features in that quilt yeah so it's it's funny because it's, it's it's sort of I suppose it represents a lot of my recent past history so I was approached by Fiona Smith um the editor at TQ to come up with a garden quilt and I've you know, always being a, wanted to do the quirky contrary thing I was thinking oh, well I won't do flowers then <laughs> you know I've done a lot of flowers anyway yeah so I thought well, what else is in the garden you know so I was thinking well veg need veg um I'd made a quilt called Mr McGregor's garden a, a while a couple of years before that had a little radish so I thought yeah, the, the, you know, the veg angle definitely Perfect, is a goer. Yes. So we did rows of veg. Well, they wanted a row by row quilt. Mm-hmm. And I did garden tools, um, a rhubarb force or a little robin. And then we had the top row was like my dream greenhouse. And we had a couple of apple trees, a little basket, a very tiny little wheelbarrow. That was very cute. And are these paper piece? No, no, they're no, just conventionally just, just pieced. Regular yeah, piecing. Yeah. With this, I, and again, I've used this cute little angle of mine um, that I like using. I've developed this method of making um, and there's a tiny bit of applique. I, I, bias strips are brilliant because they're all turned under. So I use bias strips quite a lot in my designs. And then I have a lovely beanstalk wending its way around the border with little bumblebees. And so it's full of all of my favourite, favourite things, really. It's kind of one of those dream veg patches that never needs weeding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. And um, okay, so we first met, well, I thought we first met at the Festival of Quilts, but actually we went back a bit further and realised we met in London at the uh, Fat Quarterly Retreat, I think about 2012, 2013. Um, But you do have a stand at the Festival of Quilts every year, so I always get to catch up with you then, which is lovely. Um, So can you tell us a little bit about the work involved preparing for such a big show as the Festival of Quilts? It, it, It is it is quite a job. It's it's kind of the one show I do every year because you know it, the the logistics, even coming from Shropshire, 
which isn't far really, are quite um, quite difficult. Um, so I took, I think the first couple of years I had the smallest stand. I think pe- there are people out there who have wardrobes bigger than the first stand I took. <laughs> <laughs> so the, my idea was to kind of cram as much onto that very tiny stand as I possibly could. Yes. And by total serendipity, I got um, a stand opposite the Orofil stand which is fantastic because it's a busy aisle. Yes. And I have another, there's an, um, a New Zealand company called Kids Quilts. They're opposite me as well. They feature quite heavily in my <laughs> Festival of Quilts story because having design, you know, designed at this layout for the stand, you know, I was going to get just completely cover the stand in quilts, really. And I'd had them bunched up in the corners. I brought um, a kind of fold down bed to make a settee at the back to, and had loads of cushions and stuff on there. So it looked super cozy and I knew it had to be really eye-catching as people walk down the aisle. And of course, we, we crammed, we chipped things into the top of the car um, and came down from Shropshire. It's so only about an hour away. So you had helpers. Yeah, husband. Yes, yeah. <laughs> roped in. <laughs> found himself inexplicably <laughs> pulling up a stand. Didn't really want to be there, but bless him, you know, sort of he, he copes. Um, and we got there and we realised we'd forgotten our stepladder. So we had oh, no way of putting no. these up. So bless David at Kids Quilts over the way. had come all the way from New Zealand with a stepladder. <laughs> <laughs> so we, he lent us ours. So uh, people on the art, they were just so lovely. It was an amazingly brilliant atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Everybody frantically trying to get everything up. Up and ready in Up time. and ready. Mm-hmm. But there's quite a lot of um, prep before you go. And obviously yes. the first year is always horrible because you don't know what's coming. So you're not, when you've got your stand, you then have to order the lighting, a plug for you to charge your phone and your little paypal reader and you have to order everything you know think about insurance yes. and those all kinds of, i mean they, they do send you through a, a big sort of tick list so that you you can uh, you can go through it all you know health and safety reports and all kinds of things that just had not i'd not occurred to me that i'd have to to do to think about and in yeah. terms of layout did you sort of have it all drawn out and... i am an architect so yes it's all drawn of course scale, you did of Sarah, course you yes. did <laughs> <laughs> what was going to go where? I actually did make something for that first show, which again is total lunacy. So I spent, uh, I decided I was going to do a reproduction of the um, Sanderson quilt, which is designed about 150 years ago, but it, it is the most modern looking quilt. It's a giant eight pointed star with um, just in a plain fabric with a, a double plain border around it. It looks incredibly contemporary. Um, and it was meant to be the the finishing piece. Miss Sanderson was a what was known as a quilt stamper. So people would um, send their quilts off to be marked for hand quilting. Yes. Um, and, it, and it said stamping, but it was actually it was all hand drawn with the blue pencil. Mm-hmm. It's these beautiful meandering feathers that went around the edge. And I mean, just the skill of this lady. And she would have um, apprentices and the Sanderson star was their finishing piece. Once they once they could piece one of those they were good to go into the world, you know, and uh, carry on stamping for other people. But I decided I would cheat <laughs> and I broke it because it was one piece. So you can imagine that there's sort of like, I don't know, 16 um, very sharp corners to piece, which I obviously didn't want to do that. So I broke it down. So it's, it's kind of like a, a cheats version. She'd probably be really cross. So did she, you write a pattern for I that? I did write a pattern oh, right. for that, yeah. So that was that was my I thought that was on the back of the stand because it was such a striking quilt. Mm-hmm. So a lot of ladies who actually I found had pieced the real thing came to see it. Um <laughs> disapprovingly. <laughs> well, I don't know, they were very, very kind. They were very kind. At least they were on the stand having a chat. I mean I mean most of the time, you know, obviously I sit at home, you know, in my spare room, just me and the dog. <laughs> just sewing. So it was it was um that first year it was it was Quite it a is, thing. It's that stark contrast, isn't it, from being yeah. home alone, like you say, with the dog, um, working on your own, sort of just with the radio on in the background, working yeah. on your quilts and then going to Festival of Quilts and there's literally hundreds, thousands of people and you're talking all day and smiling yes, all exactly. day. It's exhausting, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, it's fantastic. It's great fun. It's great but... to meet everybody, but I think as a kind of... I, th- I find it's a lot of quilters, they're kind of... Um, a lot of quilters are quite introvert yes. people. So to kind of be there and, and kind of, I don't know, put yourself forward in that way, it, it did feel, it was that first day, I remember feel, I was really, really, really nervous. I mean, everyone was so lovely that I've, I don't think I've ever felt nervous about it since because, you know, you're amongst your people, Absolutely. you know, amongst your tribes. And, and actually it's lovely. easy to chat to people because you have so much in common, Yeah, I find. you know, Very much so. All you have to do is say, you know, what are you working on at the moment? Yeah, and, and people, people show you off. photos That's and it. it's great. It. Yeah. yeah, it's great. And so it how fine. many years have you been doing it now? 
I've done three years three now. Three years. Yeah. And will we see you there in 2020? Yeah, you definitely will. Yes. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I got a slightly bigger stand last year, actually, so you could actually come onto the stand and talk to me. I had got a table and everything and a whirly stand and I had to put the patterns on. Yes, so it's I remember. it got very sophisticated. Very sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you also designed for Moda Bake Shop. Um, how did that come about? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, well, that, that was, um, I would encourage anybody if they want to design and um, to approach the Moda Bake Shop. If you love, a pre- I love to pre-cut. Obviously, the first project I made was with a pre-cut um, and they are brilliant. And then I'd, I encourage anybody who's a new quilter just to pick up some of those squares and sew them together and have fun. Um, so I, I was quite sort of used to sewing with pre-cuts and, and thought of a few quick patterns that would use them. And Moda Bake Shop is, uh, it does have some more complex things on there, but mainly it's 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 a, a tool for shops to use so they can kit the patterns you've put on there with the pre-cuts in because they kit so beautifully. Mm-hmm. Um, and to encourage new quilters as well. It's a good starting point. Really, isn't it? really good if starting point. Yeah. yeah. So I, I submitted an idea to them. Um, and they accepted it, which felt, oh my gosh, I always remember feeling just absolutely elated, elated. Yeah, yeah. Sure. that somebody, oh, somebody likes this enough to publish it on their website. So I've done a few um, full size, I think I've done three full size quilt projects for them. And they often do um, really fun sew alongs now. So um, I generally do one a year. So I've done a couple of Christmas ones. And I did the summer one this time round, um, which was all beach themed. So I did a little beach hut for them. But, you know, some of the things like I did, uh, it was quite funny. One of the Moda Bake Shop uh, projects got me meeting one of my heroes um, at festival this time round because last Christmas I did the Christmas so along and I did a little Dala horse block. I've seen your Dala horse. Yeah, I love it's a, a real horse. cutie. The it's block very, is adorable. And it's, uh, I really love that little block and I sort of embroidered. And I'm, I'm not the best embroiderer, but I put some embroidery on there. And um, we had Jenny Doan at the festival this year. Yes, that's I right. mean, what an incredibly lovely lady. And in the mornings, um, she would spend time going up and down saying hello to all the traders. I mean, because she is a shopkeeper at heart. And even though that she was there, you know, as our superstar and doing trunk shows and stuff, she still went out, made time to go out and connect with all of the storeholders, which was really And that lovely. says so much about her, doesn't it? Exactly, she's it really, really does. connecting with Incredibly the lovely lady. The and... and often, I, I, normally when I go into to festival, I go in quite, uh, as soon as the doors open and I'll do any restocking I have to do. And then I get my phone camera out and go whizzing around because all of the aisles are empty and all of the... The quilt to exhibitions are empty. Yes. So it's my chance to go around and have a look what everybody else has done. Before it's, you have to work all day. Well, it's yeah. a filling your cup sort of, you know, thing. Because, you know, what everybody else has made is incredibly inspiring to Absolutely. go and look at the... There's always amazing antique quilts from the um, Quilters Guild there, which I want to go and see. And, uh, you know, just amazing work by work that you wouldn't see normally, um, certainly not in mid Shropshire anyway. Um, so I go off and take photos and I was just heading back to my stand and the girls at Olive and Flo hand- Handcraft next door were going absolutely nuts saying, Jenny Doan is on your stand, Nicola, where have you been? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but the Dala horse, she has Swedish heritage, so the Dala horse had oh, caught her eye. Right. So we got a photo with Jenny with the, holding the Dala horse gift Brilliant. bag. And I obviously sent her a pattern. Um, yeah, so that was... And she really is, because I watched all those Missouri Star YouTube videos yes, when I was too. learning to quilt. Yes, absolutely. They're and she's fantastic. such a warm, lovely, um, which she made it all seem doable, which is, it's not, that's not a given, actually. You know, it's not, uh, there are complications to quilting, but if somebody can explain something really easily the way that she does, you know. I, I think do, it's the delivery, it's so important. So warm, so, you know, so, so can do. So it was a real thrill meeting her. Oh, that's really. so exciting. <laughs> Um, and you've been working with the Quilters Guild re- recently, oh, yeah. uh, teaching classes in um, sea salt in Bath. Yeah, uh, that uh, sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so tell us more. Yeah, well, that was that was really exciting. Another um, conversation I had at festival this year, actually. Um, I know Debs, um, who is uh, closely involved with the Quilters Guild. Um, Previous from, guest on yeah, my Yeah, exactly. Show. Yeah. So we, we, um, we love similar kind of quilts. I mean, I love everything Debs makes, really. So we've been friends on Instagram for quite a long time. Um, and she came along with another Guild member when I was at festival and said, you know, they were thinking about doing this. And, you know, would, would I be interested? And basically, I've designed blocks for Sea Salt to use uh, with their customers. So they're, they're very... Um, they're very sort of community minded as as a brand, 
so they have a lot of uh, scraps of fabric, which seems so full circle because quilting was always about using scraps of clothing fabric. Is this sea salt you're talking about? Yeah, now? sorry, yeah, yeah sea salt. Um, they, so they had a lot of their voils left from making um, scarves and things that they and it was last season's design so they obviously couldn't use them again, again but, they, yeah. but they wanted to use this excess fabric in a, and it's beautiful soft foil so they wanted to use it in a, a you know in a, a really community-minded way so they'd approached the Guild, Quilters Guild to see if if between them they could come up with a way of using it so we eventually um, I designed some blocks for them and they set up workshops I think there were about 12 workshops in um, uh, in the in the sort of southwest uh, mainly in Cornwall because that's where they're based mm-hmm. um, and people came along and made a couple of blocks each and then by the end of a of a couple of hours of workshop we we would piece a quilt top so fantastic and all of these quilts once they're quilted are going to be d- donated to St Petrox which is um, cares for the homeless in Cornwall um, where Sea Salt's based so they've they're, they're really going to go on and live another life and be really useful, which is fantastic. And that's great, isn't it? Yeah. Because people are learning new skills, yeah. coming together as a community, and then it's giving back to the community as well. Totally. That's, that's fantastic. So, I've, And I, I think the, the project got the final go-ahead. We were actually away in Singapore at the time. So I got the email when I was away. But I had, obviously, a really long flight back <laughs> to sit, Just sit uninterrupted <laughs> with my... And I sort of, um, obviously, that didn't really have... And I have, I have to be admitted, I do have a, quite a good working knowledge of the sea salt catalogue. So I, can, I knew, <laughs> I knew, kind of knew what their fabrics were going to, what they were like and what their design ethos is. And I'd, we'd been to Cornwall that summer, so I had all of my holiday photos. So I just sat and looked at them. I did like a bit of a brainstorm of Cornish words and then came up. I came up with about a dozen blocks. And I think they chose six in the end for the workshops to use. Um, and to have that opportunity to actually go and teach as wonderful. well. Wonderful, yeah. So I went down to the, I must give credit actually, it was at Kate at the Makery um, in Bath who was leading the workshop. So I just went to unpick things for people, <laughs> encourage them. <laughs> and I, I think I did, we did sew, Debs and I, she did have a hard, we were hard at work sort of sewing rows, rows together. Um, so we did, we, so we do feel we've had a hand in, in one of those quilts and I'm actually making another quilt for them. Oh, lovely. They sent me because they had a bit of fabric left. So they've um, sent that to me. So I'm making, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I had a sea salt dress that I wore to death all summer, which has inspired the new quilt. So all will be revealed quite ah, soon. So is this a new quilt design? It might be. It might be. I will see how, see how it goes. <laughs> well, no, it's, look, it's looking really good. It's, it's kind of like a riff on, on my day out quilt but I'm going to do add some extra elements to it. So I'm looking Ooh. forward to showing you that. I've showed yes. it, shared a little bit on stories while I was making it, but um, I'll wait until it's safely in Sea Salt's hands before I uh, share the finish with everybody. Oh, lovely. But it's coming on really well. So uh, you sound very busy. Yes. Uh, have yeah. you got any exciting plans for 2020 that you can share with us? Well, one of the coolest things I've done this year, I decided I could do a, like a mad thing. You know, I think I'll do a new mad thing every year. Um, this year's mad thing was I thought I'm going to I'm going to start kitting projects. Oh, that's a um, nice idea. Yeah, because I, you know, I have such I have quite strong, you know, strong feelings about the fabrics. I have fabrics I like to use, you know, really lovely quality fabrics um, on my quilts. I think it really helps. And and I think I find myself drawn to certain color palettes all the time. And my customers say they're drawn to those palettes, too. So thinking, what can I do? You know, really nice to put kits together. So I put together some kits for Festival of Quilts just to see how they went, and they were really popular. And then I sort of had a really bonkers idea. I've got another lovely, really friend, a really fantastic friend on Instagram who I've known. We've kind of bonded over a shared love of Tilda fabric and fig tree fabrics. And um, that's Andrea at the Willow Cottage uh, Quilt Company in Canada. So I said, you know, how about we do a block of the month? <laughs> Ah. And she didn't. She didn't write back immediately and say, <laughs> "Nicola, you're bonkers." She said, "Oh yeah, that's really exciting." So we we planned this um, since last spring. So we're it's, we're into month. We're month three is about to go out next week, but we are plotting and planning for next year. We've had such a fantastic time doing it. So we are this Christmas. I'll be designing next year's for next block year. of the month, which will start next October but we'll be releasing more details in May because we've got the fabric lined up already and oh that's very exciting yes yes distinctively French theme this year people mm, ooh la la mm. 
yeah. So yes. very exciting. <laughs> and it's so wonderful, isn't it, to collaborate with people? Yeah. And the fact that we can collaborate internationally as well. It is brilliant. Um, you know, Instagram and social media and the internet makes us a global community. And so much of what we do can be international yeah. these days. We can yeah. work with people from other countries. And it's totally. lovely to have those different influences, isn't it? it it's really it's really exciting. And, and she's been incredibly supportive. I think we've um, we've nearly broken the DM feature on our phone. <laughs> <laughs> is there a trip to France for a bit of research? Oh, I wish. I think she'd love to go. Yeah. <laughs> she, I think she she'd be up for that definitely. Yeah. definitely. Uh, and finally, um, we liked. I like to offer the listeners um, a couple of top tips mm. uh, relating to quilting or business or social media. And yeah. I know you have many tips. Uh, what would yes. you like to share today? Well. I was thinking really hard about this on the train on the way down, you know, sort of what I'd, what I'd share. I think in the age, I think we're always dashing around at the moment. I'm just feeling this very much at this time of year. Um, it's been a very busy autumn and we're dashing around. And I, I think, although it's going to sound ridiculous because obviously I'm often making things to a deadline, but I think enjoying the slow process of making a quilt is really important. It doesn't matter how you do it, whether you're hand piecing or whether you're sitting at your machine with the radio on high, you know, just enjoy the actual process of making. Don't, don't just keep rushing towards that finish if yes. you possibly can. Um, I'm often, because often when I'm making for a deadline, I've got something else quietly on the go and it might just be, I make a block a month, but it's really nice to, um, just to slow down really and appreciate what you're making, uh, because it's a it's a beautiful thing to do, you know. You're playing with beautiful fabric, and you the results are always lovely. It's um, about savouring it, I think, isn't it? Exactly. Really... And I think it, there's so much about our lives that's rush, rush, rush. That I think yeah. it's really lovely just to slow down and enjoy the process of what you're doing. Um, and tip two, again, not very technical, because I know a lot of my predecessors on this podcast have given fantastic. Um, technical tips I've always felt a little bit on the back foot technically because I came to quilting you know so late coming to quilting but um I would say keep a notebook keep a notebook and I, this again is something I've been doing since I was working as an architect but just to jot just a little notebook so when you see something or to list all the many patterns you think you're going to want to make yeah. but just keep a little notebook to keep on top of your ideas and this, this is as a business owner as well I would say yes. um, because it you might have a little sort of dash of inspiration you might not be able to do it for a couple of years it might take other things to fall into place but if you keep on making notes like every pattern I write I must make notes of it gosh I don't know 50 times before it ever goes into a pattern mm -hmm. just keep on refining keep on refining and think about you know how things are made and like you say, when you have that flash of inspiration, write it down. Yeah. Because if you don't, it, it, just can, it can just know. flitter away and then Absolutely. you forget. Yeah. I quite often use the notes on my yes, phone. Yes, brilliant. brilliant. And there's even a draw function on there. there so is. sometimes it's very indecipherable to anybody else, but I'll just do a quick squiggle, but that will be enough to remind me. Just to remind me. you. Drawing of, is just like writing. You know, The more yeah. you do it, you know, you'll develop your own style. But, yes. uh, but So, yeah, but definitely keep a notebook. Brilliant. They're great tips. Thank you, thank Nicola. You. Well, thank you so much for being my guest today. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Oh, it's been a you. pleasure. And I look forward to seeing what uh, 2020 brings. Yes, exciting. Thank Same. you. <laughs> thank you once again to my sponsors for this episode, Today's Quilter and Love Patchwork and Quilting magazine. Don't forget you can try these magazines out for yourself with this exclusive three issues for £5 offer visit www.buysubscriptions.com forward slash the GBQ podcast.